Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son. Us comfortless. And to that place where our reigns with you and the A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. With Paul and Silas, we came to Philippi of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the Most High God who, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into the prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, 
since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for on the house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that... <coughs> He had become a believer in God. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 97. We will read, this, read the uh, psalm by whole verse. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. Clouds and darkness were around about him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies on every side. His lightnings light up the world, and the earth sees it and is afraid. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Confounded be all who worship carved images and delight in false gods. Bow down before him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the cities of life. For you are the Lord most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The Lord loves those who hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints and delivers them from the land. Light has sprung up for the righteous, and joyful gladness for those who are true-hearted. A reading from the Revelation to John. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let everyone who hears say, come. And let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. The word of the Lord.
Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, that the world does not know as I know, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to you, and I will make it, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I am them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord Christ. Please be seated. Jesus prayed for his disciples, and he said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Let's just stop right there for a second. Does that seem like a tall order to you? It is. <laughs> on just how divided the disciples were at almost every point in Jesus' ministry. Just 12 hand-picked men that were supposedly spearheading the larger ragtag group of Jesus' followers, half the time they behaved like a bunch of grade school boys playing kickball. All be one? How do you mean that, Jesus? The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. Really. That they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them. Jesus prays on behalf of those who will believe in him through the disciples' message. That's us. Jesus prays this so that the world may believe. And the unity that Jesus asks for between disciples, between us, is a unity that is to imitate the unity that Jesus and the Father enjoy. Wow. We Christians are called to be as tight as the members of the Trinity are tight. That's pretty tight. This Jesus asked for so that the world may know that God the Father sent Jesus and know that God the Father loves us just like he loves Jesus. Be one, believe, so the world will believe. This is hard stuff. It kind of sounds like poetic pie in the sky when you read Jesus' words directly from our gospel account today, but this is both very serious and very necessary, as well as very difficult to accomplish. Have you ever just sat and thought about the fact that the reason the whole world does not believe in Jesus may be because we who do believe in Jesus and who do know him are so lousy at loving one another? I have, <laughs> too often. It's kind of depressing. Today I'd rather focus on the idea of believing as opposed to the idea of unity, but both are equally important in today's gospel reading. And the two ideas are intertwined, so it's hard to ignore one of them. Regarding unity, the one major thing I would like to point out is that there is a huge difference between unity and uniformity. Sometimes that doesn't occur to us. We are not called to be one by becoming all the same, by becoming uniform. Unity is far more profound than uniformity. We are not all to have the same opinions or convictions or gifts or desires or strengths. If we were all the same, 
the kind of community that we would produce would be lopsided in every way and ultimately dangerous and misguided. Communities that might appear to be one or unified because of uniformity only manage to stick together because some unnatural forces are imposed upon them to keep things in line. Dissenting voices are squashed. New and different ideas are silenced and forced to die off. It amounts to the cultivation of a monoculture, like a cornfield or a bean field. All the plants must line up and look alike. No weeds are allowed. No other kinds of healthy or helpful plants are allowed either. Fertilizers, weed killers, and insecticides must be used to make the one plant community thrive in the unique and limited way that it's expected to thrive. That does not happen in nature. That's not a healthy community. With true unity, on the other hand, it is essential that there be a wide variety of characteristics, of personalities, of strengths and weaknesses, of desires and goals present in the group. Differences are essential to unity, and these differences can only live and be expressed fully in community where they affect one another in healthy ways, in unity, by not insisting on being the only living and thriving kind of plant in the field. A community gains strength as the individual members of it relinquish all efforts to dominate the overall ecology of the field. We humans are a lot more comfortable with uniformity than we are with unity. Because unity requires humility in individuals that are different. Death to self is what makes community possible. Assertion of one's own value or importance is destructive and counterproductive because it does not foster relationship. It only fosters the importance of the individual. Unity requires diversity. Diverse members deciding and working to live in relationship in spite of their differences, committed to sticking together with no single member clinging to its own importance. It's hard, but it's the only thing that works. And Jesus' model of dying to self makes it possible. If we could only allow the Holy Spirit to divest us of our selfish need to affirm our own self-importance. We should probably offer an entire Sunday School series of classes on unity. Somebody write that down. Belief, however, is our point of emphasis today. Belief. Most people find it far easier to believe something if there is proof of what they are being called to believe is true or that it's worth believing. Parenthetically, this is why true unity is so important in the church, which is called to evangelize the world. Unity bears witness to the presence and ongoing work of a God who keeps us humble and focused on caring for others. But there are other kinds of proof that we believe in a supernatural loving God. The Acts of the Apostles that we read today show us Paul and Silas being sprung from prison by an earthquake as they had been praying and singing in their cell. The Roman guard is ready to commit suicide because he assumes that he's lost his prisoners, which would be failing his post. When he finds out that everybody is still there, he is so relieved that in disbelief and gratitude he falls down at Paul's feet and asks, what must I do to be saved? What is Paul's answer? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe. It's a big word. So do you? Do you believe in Jesus? Uh-oh. Father Greg is going off the deep end. He's turning all evangelical on us. 
You know, we Anglicans started preaching the gospel in this so-called evangelical way back in the first Great Awakening before there were any Methodists or anybody else doing it. <laughs> the need for faith in Jesus Christ is our message. It is the basic Christian message. The gospel message is that we have direct access to God because Jesus Christ has made it available, made it possible. And there's no other way to get that kind of life-giving connection to God. No one comes to the Father but through me, Jesus says. That was the message in the beginning of the church, preached to all who would listen, including Jewish leaders, who certainly believed that they had their own unique and life-giving connection to God. That was the message 20 centuries ago, and it is still the message. The good news of Christ making our connection to the Father possible is good news, because in the end, it is the only thing that human beings really need. It's what the whole creation needs, and it's what God desires and has always desired. Those things did not fit together in the same sentence until Jesus made it possible for us. We need to be restored, remade. Do you believe in Jesus? It might seem like kind of an odd question at first, especially if you don't hang around Christians very much. Some people take the question lightly. Do you believe in aliens? Do you believe in Bigfoot? Do you believe in the Easter Bunny? It could kind of seem like that kind of question at first. But the question, do you believe in Jesus, is not asking, do you believe that Jesus exists or that he existed? It goes way deeper than that. Asking the question, do you believe in Jesus, means do you believe that Jesus is who he claims to be? Do you believe that he is who and what the rest of the Bible claims that he is? Do you believe that the person and work of Jesus Christ constitutes your salvation from all the ugly and evil forces that strive to deceive you, to destroy you, and to pull you away from God? Do you believe that Jesus connects you to the God who created you? That he loves you? That he relates to you and wants you to relate to him? That he lived and died for all people and for all of creation, but more importantly, to you, that he lived and died and was resurrected for you. Among all the hundreds of millions of people for whom he also lived and died, because God specifically did not want to lose you. I'm just rephrasing our baptismal questions here, really. Do you trust Jesus as your Jesus Christ as your savior? Yes. Jesus is the savior of all things, of all people, if they want to allow it. But within that bigger picture, do you own that broader salvation personally, seeing your own salvation and relationship with God as something that Jesus provides for you? Do you give thanks for that? It's not just about an impersonal big, a big picture, true or not. It's not just about facts. It's about relationship. New radical relationship is the fact. The fact is relationship. It's both and or. So do you? Do you believe in Jesus? People who met him in the flesh just knew because he touched them and he healed them. He still does that, but time and people and books and probably a little too much thinking on our part can make it seem like some big philosophical and political question that's more impersonal. We think that we are clever and sophisticated. We think that we are intelligent and educated and that we have to think seriously about this thing, that we all want evidence. We need all the evidence, as if we are qualified to put God on trial in a court case or a chemistry lab. It's not bad to want evidence. There's more than enough. We just have to recognize it. 
It's not a difficult question. And ironically, our opinion about it is not that important. Which is to say, real is real, whether we believe it or endorse it or not. It's simple. Believing in Jesus Christ is believing that all that exists can and should be restored to the way it was meant to be from the beginning. It doesn't matter if you think evolution is the method God used to create everything over what seems like a long time to us, or if you think God did it all in one very busy week. Jesus includes it all in himself. It doesn't matter if you think other religions might have some truth to them. The fact is, if people are going to be saved and reunited with God for eternity, it's because Jesus Christ makes that, imp makes that possible, no matter what religion they belong to. He might just have enough grace to go around, even for people who believe the wrong things. And I guarantee you, everybody believes some wrong things. Jesus includes it all in himself. It doesn't matter if you think rock and roll is evil and shouldn't be in church. Or if you think classical music is stupid and boring and shouldn't be in church. Jesus includes it all in himself. Do you believe the beginning of the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Do you believe the letter to the Colossians? He is the image of the, invisible, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You know, in college, I had an analytical chemistry professor, Dr. Narl C. Hung, very short woman. I, I didn't put this in here. I just thought of it. And she was nominated for the Nobel Prize at least twice. And she used to say to us from the front of the classroom, you see this test tube here where this reaction is going on? If God took his finger out of this test tube, that reaction would not work the way it's supposed to. All things hold together in him. All things work the way they are supposed to because he makes it work. How about Paul's first letter to the Corinthians? I remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news I proclaim to you, which you in turn received and in which you also stand, through which you are also being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Or Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See. Everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he has passed on to us this ministry of reconciliation. In Christ, God reconciles the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against us and entrusting this message of reconciliation to us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for our sake, so that in him we might receive the righteousness of God. I could go on all day, but I won't. <laughs> Believing these things in our minds only still amounts to just believing, giving mental assent to a list of facts or of claims. Faith is a lot more than just believing in that way, that certain things are true. Knowing the right stuff does not save us. Let me repeat that. Knowing the right stuff does not save us. Demons know all the right stuff about Christ, and yet they reject his lordship. 
Yale and Notre Dame liturgical professor Aidan Kavanaugh used to tell his students, I hope just because you know a lot about Jesus and the church and liturgy that you're not suffering under the delusion that that makes you a good Christian. Knowledge and faith are two different things. Knowing about faith and having faith are very different. Knowledge will not save you, but faith will both save you and change your life. Knowing the good news is a start, but we need to make that next move to trusting. Trusting Jesus, trusting the good news. We can rely on that good news. We can put our whole weight on it as if it were a chair. We can lean against it because it is a strong wall that will not move. We can walk in faith with confidence, like we're walking down a smooth asphalt road at night in the dark, with confidence, knowing that it will always be there under our next step. Salvation is not a product that we can put on a sh in a shoebox and stick on a shelf in our closet. Okay, got it. Check that one off. As if all that matters is owning it. No, salvation is a byproduct. It's a byproduct of a living relationship. We are saved because we are in relationship. The light bulb works because the wires are connected. The real question we should start with is not, am I saved? Or even, do I believe? But do I have an ongoing relationship with God in Christ? That relationship that makes me one with God. If you do, then you can be assured that you are saved, even if you don't feel like it. Communicate. Believing is not naivete. We don't have to suspend use of our intellectual faculties in order to believe. Believe me, I'm not naive or stupid or ignorant. Well, sometimes. And I would not invest my time in life as a priest unless I knew absolutely that what I am doing is working in and through and for Jesus Christ himself because of what he has done and because of what he is doing not because somebody told me that, but because I know it's true firsthand. Jesus Christ is the most solid truth that there is. I don't just know about Jesus or about the faith. I know Jesus. And he knows me. And he loves me anyway. That's pretty amazing. He speaks to me, he touches me, he urges me to do some things and not to do other things. He looks back at me through your eyes. We can all know what that's like. Priests are not special when it comes to knowing Jesus. He's available. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is what Paul and Silas reveal to that prison guard and his family the day of that earthquake. This is the faith that Jesus prayed for us to have because he knew that if we really had it, unity might be possible. We might just be able to share his good news with others. If you're not sure whether you truly believe in Jesus, but you know that you want to, or if you feel that strange desire, that new and unfamiliar but powerful draw, the next thing to do is easy. Just trust him. Trust him and believe in him. You can rely on him. You can talk to him. So just do it. Ask forgiveness for your sins, even if you don't know what they are, even if you think that you are sin-free. None of us really knows the depth of all of our sin or how it separates us from God and his love for us. Just ask forgiveness and say, Jesus, save me. I want you. I want to be with you. I am yours. Thank you. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to draw closer to you every day for as long as I live. God is not angry with us. 
He's angry with Satan for deceiving us and holding us for ransom. Captives of, of our own poor choices. Choices made based on false information, by the way, because our first parents were duped by a liar, and we get duped all the time. If you would ever like to talk with me further about anything, please know that my office is open and that I'm available. St. Michael's will be a strong and powerful church for Christ if we are each filled with the one whose work we do and if we are open to the move of the Holy Spirit in our midst. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let everyone who hears say, Come. Everyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who wishes receive the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now let us stand and affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not me, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people for today is Form 6 in the Book of Common Prayer beginning on page 392. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily work and life, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for our president and for all who serve, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims, the victims of, of hunger, hunger fear, fear injustice, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister the sick, the friendless, and the needy. We pray especially for the people and leaders of Ukraine and Russia, refugees and the countries that are receiving them, and those that have lost their homes and loved ones.
for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, for especially Alex, Robert, Grant, Anna Claire, Adam, Andrea, Barbara, Jared, Joe, Cervella, Father Greg, Linda, Helen, Eric, Mary, and for the victims of the irrational violence, their families and communities. Are there others? For those who are celebrating birthdays this week, especially Debbie and Kelly, hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise, praise your, name your name forever and ever. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I we have we done and by no. what we have left undone. We have not with our whole hearts. We have that not we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Before I absolve you, I just, I, I mean, uh, obviously we know that it's Memorial Day weekend, especially in this community here. Uh, you'll notice that I moved the, the flag to uh, next to the entrance so that we walk in past it and go out past it. Um, but it's in the position that it's in because our nation is a part of the congregation that worships our God, whether it believes it is or not. Um, so it, it belongs out there with the congregation united with the congregation. And uh, at the end of this service, we will uh, uh, play the Star Spangled Banner as Jack loved to do <laughs> when Jack was with us. Um, but that'll happen after our closing hymn. But before I a give you absolution, um, let's just pray together for a minute. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, we live in difficult times. And this is a difficult weekend for many of us as we remember those who have fallen on our behalf, some of them dear loved ones, some of them we don't know, but who still deserve our honor. We pray that you would help us to come to terms with relationships that may have been stopped suddenly without resolution, where maybe anger was hanging in the air when a life was snuffed out and I'm sorry was never said, or I love you was never said. We grieve losing those who have been one with us because it is a, a severance of a dear relationship that you have given us in this life. We know that you love us and it is through other lives that, that you show that to us so often, so fully, so completely both in joy and in sorrow. We pray, Father, that you would bring closure, resolution,
peace to all of our hearts as we contemplate the loss of our loved ones, whether they have served in the military or not. We remember because you call us to remember. And so we give thanks to you that you are a God of remembrance. Now, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in everlasting life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please share the peace with one another. I know I should be using my cane. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> or maybe I will be sorry. <laughs> Let's walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself a perfect offering and sacrifice to God.
And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, <clears throat> joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord, of heart We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, 
we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be for us the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things into subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! Jesus, Lamb of These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray together the post-communion prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And for the last time, let us say together the post-communion uh, blessing from Easter. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through, his, through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the blessings, of uh, the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage into sin, to true and lasting freedom with the Redeemer, bring you to our eternal inheritance. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, please be seated for announcements. Bill? As you all know by now, Aaron will be leaving us on the 7th. Next Sunday will be the last Sunday she's going to be available. Uh, she will be joining us for the service and staying for coffee hour. We'd like to do something a little special on that coffee hour, so we'll be having a potluck as a farewell and I would encourage you all to uh, consider bringing something. We'd like to see you here if possible. Aaron would uh, really appreciate that, I know. Uh, if any of you are interested in contributing to a going away gift, if you would uh, make your contact with Narni, uh, she will be more than happy to uh, help you affect that. Uh, so if you would remember, Next Sunday, Aaron's last Sunday to be with us, so please come and enjoy uh, a little bit of a special potluck coffee hour to give her a, a farewell and uh, wish her the best in her new position with the diocese. We will miss Aaron greatly. I certainly will miss Aaron greatly, uh, but uh, our loss is the bishop's gain. So I expect him to remember that. <laughs> um, a couple of uh, announcements. First of all, um, I'm sure many of you are aware that uh, Alex Knizny has graduated from high school this past week. And we, yes. <laughs> Having graduated from high school myself, I know that it's a feat to be uh, applauded. Um, we have a cake for him downstairs to honor, honor his uh, graduation, so we hope that you will participate in uh, the joy of his graduation by having a piece of cake and uh, congratulating him in person. Um, also, I wanted to call attention to the fact that we have uh, VBS coming up uh, in conjunction with St. George and that we are providing a full scholarship for anyone who, uh, any child who wants to be uh, a part of that. Um, also, this summer's uh, Episcopal, um, the Diocesan Episcopal Camp, uh, we're, we have some anonymous donors who have graciously uh, provided um, for us the, the potential of free, free scholarships for anyone who would like to attend that camp this summer uh, up to uh, $1,000. So um, I would expect that we could cover pretty much anyone's attendance from this congregation, but we hope that uh, you would share that with your loved ones and uh, anyone who's members of the church here. Um, anything else? Nar did Narnie have something to say? Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ann.
Next week, in addition to Aaron's last day, is our Outreach Sunday for the year. That's the Sunday where we collect funds uh, to help with all our outreach projects during the year. Of course, the most prominent one starts the very next day, which is Feed My Lambs. Uh, we hope that you, there will be envelopes in the program next Sunday. We hope that you will uh, join us in supporting this uh, program. Uh, we will also next Sunday, after we're celebrating with Aaron, we will be making the bags for the lunches for Monday. Um, I, I hope you will be able to help us. Out in the narthex is a list for people that would come in on Monday morning. That's when we're going to finish up bagging the lunches and then deliver them. We're looking for people that are willing to go out. There's only one car needed, and we need to have two drivers on any particular uh, day. We will be delivering lunches uh, every Monday from June the 6th until August the 1st, so except for July the 4th. Um, we hope that you'll join in and sign up on that, on that sheet. My second announcement is probably around town you've seen the signs for the Memorial Day service tomorrow at the, at the monument in O'Fallon down on, West, on Wesley Street. It starts at 11.30. It's a wonderful program. It's a great monument, and we want to come and support uh, those that have given their lives. But not a lot of people know that there's a second service. If you can't make that one at 11.30, there is one in the cemetery in O'Fallon at 9 a.m. It's short, it lasts about a half an hour, but we go out there every year and we notice there's not that many people. Um, but it is a lovely cer ceremony uh, put on by the VFW. Uh, they also contribute to the later service uh, ceremony out at the monument. But we hope you can come support and honor our memorials. Thank you, Ann. I need a stool like that. Um, let us continue our worship with uh, our closing hymn, and then Elaine will lead us in the Star Spangled Banner uh, after that.
as gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight on ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave birth to the night that our flag was still there. Oh, saved us that star-spangled banner yet waved o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Play ball! Good for you.